It's possible that I don't have a coherent talk tonight. Uh, I just have a topic. I have uh, and some thoughts about it. Um, the topic is ethics and how ethics fits into Buddhism, Buddhist practice. And one of the curious things is that Buddhism is often considered to be, or to have a high standard of ethics. And it's often said that ethics, ethical life, ethical integrity is needed for, you know, going, if you really want to go far on this Buddhist path. So some people associate Buddhism with it, but there's no obvious word in Buddhism, in the Asian, like in uh, Pali, ancient Indian language, that really fits well the English word ethics. And then, um, but that's okay, because there's no good word that fits for the word spiritual. That's okay, because there's no good word that fits for the English word religion. So maybe Buddhism has nothing to do with ethics or spirituality or religion. What's left? And it's kind of like the three areas that we, we think we're doing here, right? Um, and uh, somehow. Um, and I think what's happening is that um, in West, in the English-speaking West, and uh, these are three categories that are used to somehow organize human, ex human experience. But they're not absolute categories. And um, it just happens to be that Indian Buddhists didn't have those categories. They had very full, complete human lives, but they didn't see it through the lens of what we would think of as ethics. We would think of as religion, or we would think of spirituality. And you can find things that kind of fit, so, you know, and you know, more or less fits, and we get to religious nonprofit status here in America. So that's nice and convenient. We, we're not going to tell the IRS we're not a religion, <laughs> <laughs> and that we you don't do ethics, <laughs> and things like that. That doesn't quite work. Um, uh, but in fact, um, there's um, you find if you read Buddhist texts coming from India and ancient scriptures of the Buddha. Um, there's a lot of things that most people here in the English-speaking word would consider ethical teachings. But they just don't call it that. And what, what's happening is that um, uh, in the West, there's a strong tendency to separate ethics out as its own subject and um, its own kind of field. And that goes back to the Middle Ages when uh, uh, the first kind of Christian monastic kind of universities were formed. And uh, they, had a whole, they had one whole department or field called um, ethics. And it was very important for Christians to understand ethics. And uh, partly because ethics was seen as something that was ordained or in, in commanded by God. And so for Christians back then, it was very important to try to understand what God had in mind and to interpret his ethics, his teachings, his, his, his commandment, things like that. And so ethics was something that was just out there. It, was, it came from some other place. And so it could be studied objectively. And so there was a whole uh, department of moral philosophy that's really looking at all the complexity of ethics and morality. But in Buddhism, there was no out there. And Buddhism doesn't start with a God that's offering teachings, but it's uh, starting from the inside out. It's starting from human beings. And, um, and so Buddhism is actually not that interested in, in ethics. Buddhism is interested, if anything, in ethical people. And rather than, be, rather than learning about ethics, we're supposed to learn to become ethical people who have ethical sensibilities or ethical orientations or ethical intelligence uh, and such things. And so, uh, and what we see is that the things that here in the West we would call maybe ethical are run through the course of what in the West we would call spiritual development. The development of practice, the development of path to liberation could be described as a thoroughly ethical path. 
Now, for some people, that's disappointing. Um, so I'll tell you a little story of what happened. Um, so in, um, in the 1980s, United States, there were some um, creative Buddhist teachers, creative ethically. And uh, it was difficult for a lot of people, a lot of suffering happened, the ethical behavior. And so by the early 1990s, a number of Buddhist groups in the country said, we have to have a, uh, an ethical guidelines to, you know, so these, things, these kinds of things don't happen anymore. And a lot of these Western Buddhist groups had never really thought much about ethics. They just kind of learned meditation and started offering that. And so they said, we need to actually get our act together and come up with a, a code of mor- a co- a co- a moral code for teachers and things like that. And so I was uh, involved at that point with the San Francisco Zen Center. And, um, and, uh, and I was uh, asked to be on the Zen Center board for a year. But right around that time, uh, in, the late ni- in the early 90s, Zen Center formed a committee to come up with a code of ethics for its teachers. And um, so this committee went to work, and they didn't know what to do, so they looked around, and somehow they had a connection with uh, some Jungian association, Association of Jungian Therapists or something. Well, they know how to do ethics, they thought. So they went there and and learned what they do, and they came up with a code that was uh, taken kind of right out of the Jungian Institute's codes. So the language was not Buddhist. But it had came back and had this new code of ethics for, for the teachers at Zen Center. So then uh, it was presented uh, to the community, and the community explo- exploded. You needed to have an ethics, they should have had an ethics document before they proposed their ethics document to the community. Because the community was, there was a very strong streak of what's called antinomianism in Zen at that time, which is, we don't do rules. We just kind of feel what's natural. And the practice will just, you'll just practice and practice, and you'll know intuitively how to live, and you'll kind of just know what to do. And and so this this was, uh, felt like a restriction, like laws coming from above, and rather than Zen being about freedom, now Zen was about restriction. And um, so then this uh, ethics document came to the Zen Center board, and I was on the board, right? And these are good people. These are people who, you know, very good people. I was, but there was something, it touched a nerve. And people were literally yelling and calling each other names, <laughs> talking, ab- talking about an ethics document. <laughs> it was wild. And... Um, so this thing about ethics for some, can really touch a nerve for some people, and some people will just like recoil, like that's not what I want. Buddhism is about freedom and not about this. And um, but now I'm telling you that Buddhism doesn't have ethics, so now you're okay. Um, so what does it have? Um, the goal of Buddhism in the Indian Buddhism, the teachings of the Buddha, is defined over and over again as the the cessation, the ending of three things. Three things that are called uh, roots, meaning they're deeply embedded, deeply rooted in us. And it's from this that a lot of other behavior stems, grows out of. And if you don't get down and pull out the roots, that plant will just keep sprouting more things. So the roots are uh, called greed, hate, and delusion. And sometimes, as a Buddhist teacher, I say those three words, I think, too often. I feel like I say it, you know, it's greed, hate, and del- end of greed, hate, and delusion. We're looking at greed, hate, delusion. And I, sometimes I think, you know, because we say, talk about it so much, it kind of, people start tuning out, not paying attention to it. 
But the Buddha talked about it over and over and over again. But he said, these three roots, when you get fully awakened, these three things are uprooted. So what? Our suffering that we have and the harm that we cause in the world in the Buddhist analysis come out of people's greed, come out of people's hate, and come out of people's delusion. One of the meanings, one of the understandings that a lot of people have about ethics, if it means anything at all, it means no longer causing harm. No longer causing harm intentionally to others or causing harm to oneself. And the primary source for causing harm, causing affliction is the word, is in the Buddhist analysis as greed, hate, and delusion. So the goal could be seen in Buddhism to, to be an ethical goal, as opposed to having you know, some kind of great, wonderful, blissful experience, as opposed to having some kind of great unity with the cosmos, or as opposed to having some great understanding about the secrets of the universe. The, over and over again, the Buddha was focusing on, um, on what some people would consider an, an ethical idea. Uh, coming together with this is the idea that um, if you don't have an external source of authority to tell you, you know, the injunctions you're supposed to live by, or tell you what is true, and you really have to find it for yourself in some way, what are the reliable sources of information you can rely on? What can you really know? Many people want to be told something. Many people want to have certainty about their religious beliefs. And people get sometimes uh, very attached to their religious beliefs. I know Buddhists get very attached around uh, you know, what the core teachings of Buddhism are. Because, and the more people invest into Buddhism as a religion, the more they kind of get a little bit fundamentalists. This has to be right, this is true. And people will pour over Buddhist texts and in order to get to what the truth is, what's really going on. But if the starting point is not a text, but oneself, what can you know? So here's a, a, um, a teaching from the Buddha that's repeated a few times in the suttas. Some of you have heard this before. So this thing about not going outside of yourself for sources of spiritual, religious, ethical authority. The Buddha said, do not go, and of course it's a paradox because here I'm reading the Buddha, right? So you'll see. So it's kind of like, you know, you'll, you'll maybe forgive me. Uh, Do not go, do not rely on oral tradition. Because there, there were no books back then. So nowadays we can say, do not go by books, by lineage of teaching, by hearsay, by a collection of scriptures, by logical reasoning, by inferential reasoning, by reason cognition by the acceptance of a view after pondering it, by the seeming competence of a speaker, thank you, <laughs> or because you think uh, the teach, that person is our guru, that person's our teacher. That's a phenomenal statement to make because many, uh, I think, religions rely on these things. They rely on scriptures, they rely on what teachers say, they rely on reasoning. Some people are very rational. If I don't, some people are, have this idea that, yes, I'm not going to rely on all those things. I'm going to work it out myself. And so they use their, their rationale to do it. Um, but then the Buddha says that what you can rely on, what he recommends you rely on. And he gets away with it, I think, since he's, you know, he's saying don't rely on teachers, but he's a teacher, right? He gets away with it because of what he's pointing to. But when you know for yourself these things are unwholesome, 
These things are blameworthy. These things are censured by the wise. These things, if accepted and undertaken, lead to harm and suffering. In that case, you should abandon them. So he is pointing back to yourself. When you know these things, there is some, some reference to what the wise would say and some concern about if the wise people would, you know, would criticize you. So it's not completely relying on yourself. But then he gives an example. What do you think? Is there greed? Strange question. Is there greed in this world? Yes. Um, is there hatred? Yes. Um, and is there delusion? Yes. Then he says, someone who has greed or hatred and delusion is liable to harm other people, liable to steal from other people, liable to be involved in sexual misconduct, liable to be involved in lying, and li liable to be involved, I think that's the, that's the four I think he mentions here. And um, the, um, if a person does this, does these kinds of harmful behaviors, does that lead to one's own harm for a long time? Does it lead to the harm of others for a long time? It can. Um, um, are these things, greed, hate, and delusion, and acting on them, are they wholesome or unwholesome? They're unwholesome. Are they blameworthy or blameless? Blameworthy. Are they censured by the wise or praised by the wise? They're censured by the wise. And if they are done, if they're accepted and undertaking, do these things lead to harm or to suffering? To harm and suffering. So what he's saying here is that there are certain activities that arise out of greed that you can know for yourself that they feel unwholesome. They don't feel good to do. You can know for yourself that kind of harm to yourself and to others. And you can know that they're blameworthy some, somehow. You can, they're, they're off. But how do you know this? And how, how do you do this so it's not an ethical teaching, like you're supposed to do this? But you rely on what you can know for yourself. So here is the first real... When I, w when I was introduced to Vipassana teaching, this teaching we're doing here, I was introduced to it in, Th in Thailand, and it had a big impact on me. But one of the big impacts it had was had to do with what we can call ethics. And um, so it was a long retreat. I sat and meditated uh, just all, of, all day long for 10 weeks. That was a long time. And, uh, and in the course of about that 10 weeks, maybe about six weeks into or something, um, I thought about this woman that I had met before the retreat started. And um, before the retreat started, I had kind of a garden variety lust for her, if that's allowed. You know, I was attracted to her and, you know, it, there was nothing unethical if we'd gotten together. It would have been nice, but, you know, we didn't. But I had certain desires. You're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I didn't think about it much but then at six weeks into the retreat I thought about this woman and and when I thought about the lust that I had it didn't compute because what had happened was I was so peaceful or so settled so many of my uh, my greeds, my hates, my delusions, so many of my kind of um, attachments, uh, fears had settled down. And I had a, had a, 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 a um, visceral feeling of purity, 
within. That was it. Or, cl- or being, I felt cleansed on the inside. Probably better than purity. Really cleansed. And when I thought about the lust, it just went against the grain. It was painful. It felt like chalk across the chalkboard. And I was so surprised. Wow. What is this? You know, I like, and what is I'm feeling in there? I never felt something like this before in my life. Wow. It felt unwholesome to have the lust, to have greed. Unwholesome, and it kind of felt off, or I felt like I wasn't. There wasn't integrity in it, or there wasn't some some goodness in it, or so there was this inner goodness there that somehow. And um, and this idea that there could be a reference point in side of being feeling clean or feeling a goodness or feeling something that was that's what hooked me to vipassana that was the first thing that got me wow this is impressive and so then that became a reference point for finding the way and for the buddha your whole way to liberation can be found with that inner reference point your own inner compass to understand and am I, is what I'm doing here, is it being generated by something, by attachment, by clinging, by lust, by, by greed? Is it being generated by hate or hostility, aversion? Or is there delusion in the mix of it? Somehow ignorance and confusion, projections and bias and all these other things that go on. And then to feel in oneself not that, not not come ethical idea like precept like injunction. Don't thou shalt not do that, but to feel inside that you want the system doesn't want to go in that direction. The system wants to go to being clean, to being un or say if you don't like the word language of cl- clean or purity, uh, to go to into lang- into a place to avoid contraction, to avoid stress to avoid remorse, to avoid kind of regrets, to avoid this whole inner world that can arise when we're operating under attachments. And you could feel that. And that that becomes the guide. So it turns out that in world religions, or in in the world's history, when human beings have stopped turning towards gods and religions to provide guidelines for how to live from the outside, this is what they tend to come to. Back in the ancient Greek time, they would, um, some of the Greeks, uh, kind of put aside the gods, the Greek gods, and they relied on a kind of pleasure principle. They relied on the human ability to feel you know, say pleasure and pain maybe or uh, is not maybe not the best terms, but you can feel inside of yourself uh, when something feels right or good or feels enjoyable or sense sense of well being, and when something takes that away. The utilitarian philosophy of of uh, is it Jonathan Mills? I forget his first name had the same thing, did away with the gods and religion's external reference point to tell you what to do. And what, what's the reliable information you have is something like the, something that's called the pleasure principle. You really pay attention to yourself, what's going on here, you get the information here. More recently you had Freud, who did the same thing. Freud also didn't rely on external. And he also had this idea of a pleasure principle as a guide, I think. So Buddhism also had this. So if you're not going to rely on external authorities, whatever they might be, but to rely on your own evidence, finding your own way, the Buddha's, Buddha did point to where that criteria could be. And that criteria has a lot to do, turns out, has a lot to do with forces inside that have to do with, in English, we will call ethics. And uh, forces that begin with greed, hate, and delusion, but play out in all kinds of uh, unethical behavior in the world. So Buddhism has training in what can be called ethics, 
But the training in ethics is a training in learning to pay more careful attention to yourself so that you become the reference point for it. So the most common word in the ancient language that's sometimes translated into English as ethics is, uh, the Pali word is sila, S-I-L-A. It doesn't mean ethics. It means something like virtuous behavior. And, um, and it's mostly described by the things a person abs- abstains, abstains from. One abstains from killing, from stealing, from sexual misconduct, from lying, from getting drunk or t- getting intoxicated. One abstains from slanderous speech, from gossiping, from divisive speech. One abstains from being avaricious, and one abstains from having hostility. These are the core uh, abstentions that uh, Buddhism teaches that are called sila, that in the West we often call ethics. The feeling about these sila, this ethics thing, whatever, is um, the attitude that can exist is one of loving it and delighting in it. And, uh, and this was also a surprise when I was first went to Thailand, that this idea that, um, uh, bef- uh, that one sila, living a life of goodness, can bring a tremendous amount of joy. And I thought it was really weird when I went to Thailand. These people were joyful about their ethical integrity. What? I didn't ever grow up with any sensibility that that was, could be the case. So here's a, a um, so here the word, this uh, the translation of this um, ancient text, um, the word sila here is translated as virtue, the thing that Buddhists love, and the thing which is really at the heart of the movement towards liberation and freedom. It's not just about being mindful. It's about being mindful so we could have sila. We can be mindful so we can free ourselves of being driven by these roots, these attachments that bring us suffering. So the perfection of virtue. The perfection of virtue should be thought about as follows. Even the waters of the Ganges cannot wash away the stain of hatred yet the water of virtue is able to do so. Even yellow sandalwood cannot cool the fever of lust, yet virtue is able to remove it. Virtue is the unique adornment of good people, surpassing the adornments cherished by average folk, such as necklaces and earrings. Virtue should be reflected upon as the basis for rapture and joy, as granting immunity from fear of self-reproach, the reproach of others, punishment, and and a terrible rebirth. Virtue should be reflected upon as the basis, um, virtue should be reflected upon as praised by the wise, as the root cause of freedom from remorse, as the basis for security. Virtue surpasses material wealth because thieves cannot confiscate it. Because it enables one to achieve supreme sovereignty over one's own mind, virtue surpasses the sovereignty of warriors, kings, and priests. Virtue surpasses the achievement of beauty for it makes one beautiful even to one's enemies. It cannot be vanquished by the adversities of aging and sickness. Since it is the foundation for states of happiness, virtue surpasses such dwellings as palaces and mansions. In accomplishing the difficult task of self-protection, virtue is superior to troops of elephants, chariots, and infantry as well as such devices as mantras, spells, blessings, for it depends on oneself, not on others. 
esteeming virtue as the foundation of all achievements, as the soil for the origination of all the Buddha qualities, the beginning and the chief of all the qualities issuing in Buddhahood, one should guard diligently and thoroughly perfect virtue as a hen guards its eggs. So on one hand, we can say that Buddhism really, because of this problem with language, that maybe Buddhism doesn't have ethics. On the other hand, we could say Buddhism is only ethics. That's all it is. It's, it's, um, and, if, and if you want to be liberated, if you want to be, have a lasting, enduring happiness, it's, it's kind of an ethical transformation that goes on, that happens. And, uh, and part of that ethical transformation doesn't come from doing ethics, but being ethical. It comes from developing ethical sensitivity, it's ethical sensibility, an ethical inner compass, an, an ability to find your way, and to find that it's a nourishing, supportive. It, if you want to feel safe, if you want to find a way in life to, um, you know, to have all these beautiful qualities and have joy, it's the ethics. And perhaps one of the reasons why enlightenment, the freedom, feels so good is because of the, uh, the way we, we get cleansed from these roots that are operating in us, inside of us. So, so perhaps that was a confusing talk. You know, I, I was trying to pull these different pieces together somehow for you and try to explain something. I don't know how well I did. Yes, please. I'm still. <clears throat> I was. Um, I was confused when. At the beginning, you were saying that the Buddha was saying, don't rely on anything, don't rely on teachers, don't rely on text. But then, when you are reading other texts in, from the Buddha, he was saying, don't the wise think this? Yes. Uh, so the, the, the way it works here is this... Um, uh, Uh, those things are censored by the wise, or those things. So, if you think uh, think of someone who maybe uh, the person who you have the most respect for because of their wisdom, their kindness, the way they've helped you in your life, someone who's been a teacher, someone that you really kind of uh, uh, helped you out a lot and really, really wanted, wanted the best out of you, supported the best to come up for you. And you just feel so grateful this, this wise, good person was in your life and, you know, they know you. And you are about to do something, they kind of like, really? Oh, I, that's not a good idea. Oh, that's the, I'm really disappointed now. Wouldn't that have an impact on you? It does, but it's a contradiction with the fact that at the beginning he said, don't believe in anyone else. Ah. The, uh, maybe it's too hard to only rely on oneself. But it's not saying rely on this. I guess he's saying that. But I think that, I, I guess it's, maybe it's a contradiction, but um, is there a difference between, maybe there's a difference between wise people and gurus in, in our lives. But I think that uh, we're social creatures and we're liable to make mistakes, liable to be deluded. And sometimes it's really good to take into account the people we respect a lot, what they think and what they feel and where they're at, and to be accountable to them. So if they get disappointed in us, I think that's interesting information. I have a different interpretation. Oh, please, tell me. <laughs> so. If you're thinking, don't, uh, would that be censored by the wise? 
I'm hearing it as, do you believe you yourself that is something that the wise would censor? Yeah, maybe so. Meaning, I'm using my own inner compass no. still. I'm not using right. the wise compass. I, I'd like it. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. I've, you know, I, 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 I see a word like that, and I, now I want to go back and look at the Pali, the original, because the English translations, sometimes the English translators have, some English translators have a little bit of puritanical English you know, they kind of, they, you can see how they, I've, I've looked enough at the original and see how some English translators kind of lean in certain directions with their translations. Um, so I don't know what the censored means. But also the other thing that's problematic, like what you're bringing up, is this word, this idea of uh, blameworthy and, uh, and praise. Some people think shouldn't be concerned with blame and praise. But um, is that really the case? Is it never, I mean, certainly people can be neurotically concerned about blame and praise, but it, we're such a de, uh, you know social creatures, and we're so who we are is partly you know social. So what um, what role does our community have, and uh, what role does does somehow taking into account the community around us have in finding our way, and how do these two work together? There's, can they work together in some way, or is one a protection for the other? And uh, that's one way of seeing it is that maybe people cannot really, it's, diff, it's dangerous to only rely on yourself. And plenty of people have done this and made mistakes. And you can't only rely on other people. That's also problematic. But if you have the two kind of uh, talking to each other and kind of and being accountable to each other and debating each other, then maybe it's actually safer than one or the other. And so maybe that's why we have these two together here. What do you think? Um, I think I would re-edit re the text. <laughs> You'd re-edit Great. Great. Yes, please. Uh, I guess uh, kind of two-part. Uh, first, I remember you talked about faith in the practice before. Uh, I wonder how that fits into this, uh, issues of ethics. And secondly, also, um, it seems that the role of the teacher is quite important in most Buddhist practices. Uh -huh. And how does that relate to um, becoming more ethical? Yeah, yeah. So the word faith, that's, you know, that's also a, a um, you know, I apologize for taking this, saying this over again the semantics. This is also, you know, an English word that it's, it's a little bit un unclear whether it should really re represent an Indian Buddhist word. The word that's often called, uh, translated as faith is sada, and some translators prefer confidence. And the, and the function of this sada is uh, to get you started on your practice. So if you're gonna take a class, you're probably not going to sign up and pay your hundreds of dollars for the class unless you have some modicum of confidence that it's going to be worthwhile, that the teacher is going to know, know the subject and things like that. And so to have some confidence in order to start the path to, to find out these things for oneself. So some people like the word confidence. I like the word faith because uh, faith uh, is an element of the heart, I feel. It's an emotional quality. And so we can have an emotional relationship to the things that inspire us. Or inspiration is kind of a, a, an emotion, I guess. And um, it makes us happy, or makes us warm, or makes us kind of... Um, and so some people... So I have a lot of faith in this practice. Uh, I've done it a long time, and I've seen it, the benefits from it, and, and it just lives in me in a way that I just have tremendous um, love for it, uh, trust in it. I like the word trust, um, but it's uh, um, but it's kind of verified trust. It it's comes from knowing something that I've discovered through this. So I don't know. I, I'm not real. I'm kind of meandering with an answer. So I don't know if you want to be more specific or try again, or maybe you want to define what faith is. Maybe then we can be a little bit.
Oh, okay, okay. So then the second question about the teacher. The um, uh, different Buddhist uh, lineages, different Buddhist schools have different kind of relationships to teachers. And there's a wide range of what those relationships are, are like. In, um, in, in uh, our lineage, our kind of school, uh, the tendency mostly is to not see a teacher as a guru, but rather see it more like a spiritual friend. So more like a friend who supports one, offers some guidance, um, but is not meant to be the authority who ordains what's true and what you have to do and has injunctions about how you're supposed to live your life. Um, but rather, uh, um, you know, it's not someone who has authority to require anything of anyone. But it's more a friend who can teach and make suggestions and be supportive and, and, um, and be a guide to some degree. Um, I like to think of a teacher as someone who's also a practitioner. So in some ways, maybe a practitioner is a little bit further along the path than you are. And so you can learn from that person, be supported. Um, and then we have uh, some, some schools of Buddhism where the, uh, the teach, I mean, in some, some extreme versions, uh, the teacher is supposed to have absolute authority. You know, and it's, it gets pretty intense. You're, you know, whatever the teacher says, you're supposed to do. And famous story of Milarepa. I, I don't know if you know Milarepa was a, um, Milarepa was a kind of a hermit monk in Tibet who went to, kind of to India, I guess, to study with his teacher, Marpa. And as I understand the story, as I remember it now, um, when he showed up to, to study with his teacher, his teacher's first thing he said was, I want you to build me um, like a stone house or something here. So he built it. And then, no, no, it's in the wrong location. I'd like to have it over there. So he took it all down and built it up. No, 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 over there. I think the first place. And for years, he, that's what he did. But the, the Marpa was his teacher, so his teacher said to do something, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, there's a wide range of, of options in Buddhism. So you could pick you know, what you'd like, everything in between. But be careful. <laughs> the consequences can be big. Yes. Thank you, Gil. When you began by saying that Buddhism, the early Buddhist texts, pars the terrain of spirituality, religion, and ethics in some different way, I was expecting Silo, but I also thought perhaps that the word Dhamma would come up. Maybe the talk is complicated enough that you don't want to try to go there. But yeah. doesn't Dhamma cover some of the sort of basic, almost seemingly universal ethical principles that we live by? Things like hatred does not cease by hatred and the concept, contents of the precepts. These things don't seem to require lots of subtle uh, word parsing to, to make sense of them. Yeah, this, you know, it's, it's um, complicated, these topics. Um, So I, I, I kind of like to think that the Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. <laughs> and he probably wasn't teaching Buddhism. He was teaching. But uh, it wasn't a religion in conventional terms, the way we think of now. And he didn't put himself up as being a, um, a prophet. And he wasn't didn't put himself up as being someone who channeled uh, ultimate reality or ultimate truth. Uh, it was a person who had discovered uh, something about freedom and then tried to teach that to other people. And that freedom had a lot to do with uh, clinging, uh, non-clinging. And so he taught a path of non-clinging uh, in the earliest, uh, probably the earliest text we have of the Buddha, when it was that Buddhism, his teaching became least, systemat least systematized, 
um, he has this amazing statement, or statement, he says it repeatedly, uh, that uh, you shouldn't take anything as the ultimate. For religious people, that's pretty you know, difficult. I mean, that's what religions want. They want what's ultimate. And he's not interested in the ultimate. Um, so what is he interested in? He's interested in not clinging. Because clinging is a source of suffering. And he doesn't want, he's concerned with people not suffering. So it might be naive or it might be simplistic, his solution, what he points to, but, or hard to understand how it really applies to all our lives. But um, his goal, his whole thing, was to support people so they would not suffer. Once people aren't suffering, live your life. You don't need philosophy then. You don't, and if, and if suffering, if not suffering comes with not harming anyone, you don't need ethics, I guess. And um, you don't need Buddhism. So, so in, in this kind of analysis, kind of presentation, what the Buddha was teaching was kind of a form of therapy. The therapy to help people become free of suffering. But it's kind of reductionalistic to say that. It somehow kind of almost seems to diminish what Buddhism is. Because, and I think the way it diminishes it is that, at least in my mind, when I think of that, just call it the kind of therapy for suffering, is that the uh, transformation of the heart so that all these roots of greed, hate, and delusion, all the attachments we have, are completely uprooted is such a radical transformation of the person. It's so thorough. It creates such a different vision of the world and how to live that uh, you can't just call it a little bit of it's not like therapy. And it's it's like it's you know, and that's why it's bec you know, it's kind of like offers a radical, all-encompassing new vision for how to live in the world. And so, you know, then now we're getting close to religion again, you know, the, you know, an orientation of what's, you know, of how to live, you know, a whole new orientation with, with which to live our lives. Therapy, you know, you do therapy, then you're good. And, uh, and then you have other things that are important for you, and you live your life. But with this, uh, this transformation that comes through practice, it's like the most it's like the most meaningful, valuable, fullest thing that people experience. It becomes their life, not you know I you know, you know I, I did this Buddhism thing and now I'm on to other things. Does it make sense? Okay, we're we're over now. So if some of you want to ask me a question afterwards, I can stay here and I'm happy to answer. And and as I said, I didn't really have a talk today. I just had a topic that's been on my mind. And so I kind of just, you know, try to pull it together for you. And if, if it was too complicated, I apologize. And, and you, can, you can just, you know, leave it here. <laughs> you, you, you don't have to take it with you. So thank you. Good night. <laughs>